One of my favorite authors and storytellers is Ruth Moose. So the good news is that she's got a newly assembled book called Rules and Secrets, full of her short stories from her total career. And even the better news is that she's going to be my guest on North Carolina Book Watch next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin, and my guest is Ruth Moose, who's the author of the stories in a book of collected stories called Rules and Secrets. Ruth Moose, welcome. Thank you. Well, you served on the creative writing faculty at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill beginning in 1996. Huh? You're the author of multiple books of short stories and poems. Your work, uh, both poetry, short stories, and other huh? Writings has appeared in numerous uh, journals, magazines, and um, many of those stories are now in the uh, in Rules and Secrets that we'll be talking about later. But I, what I love is that you take us into North Carolina, into the small <laughs> towns and the forest, uh, the farms, in, in sort of what we call the Uwari region right. of North Carolina. And so if you want to know North Carolina, I tell people, read Ruth <laughs> Moose's. If you want to know the people of North Carolina as they really are, I read Ruth Moose's short stories. How did the um, how did the lands and the people, uh, the farms, those things that were going on in the Uari Mountain <laughs> region um, affect your stories? Well, you know the the old adage, write what you know. And uh, so Flannery O'Connor said, you know, if you anybody who survived the first five years of childhood has all they need to write about <laughs> for the rest of their life. And, um, and I kept thinking, uh, I went back and I looked at a lot of my stories and they were all within a couple blocks of each other where I grew up. This is where, where they were set based on some of the people who lived there, some of the neighbors. Uh, so it's just writing about people I knew that, that I found uh, not ordinary people, but ordinary people who were extraordinary people. Well now, you know my favorite story of yours. Which one? Which, this is the story of the little girl who's trying to memorize the <laughs> Psalms. And this has, uh, tell us the story, or a little bit about the story and then how it intersected with your real life. Well, uh, it's the first story I wrote. And I was taking a correspondence course with Doris Betts through UNC. I was her first student. I had two small children. My husband was an artist who worked at home. This is before they had low residency. Uh, MFA before the uh, computers and everything and so we did it by mail and Doris was so wonderful uh, she wrote the the text and the assignments which is just to me one of the best creative writing textbooks ever but I would mail in an assignment and it would come back by return mail she was that good so this this was your start in this was formal start writing you're in writing, writing these stories writing as, an, these assignment as an assignment for doris, Betts. For doris Betts. you were just a student <laughs> yeah i was just a student and so maybe arguably i don't want to say arguably your best but one of my favorite stories came from this uh, assignment in a creative writing a correspondence yeah, course yeah a correspondence course in creative writing from unc all right well tell it now tell us the story <laughs> the story is called the swing and um it was, you know, an early, early, uh, well, it was my first story, like I said, and when I put it together in the collection, I was so afraid a critic would say, well, the stories are okay, except this is one week story. Nobody ever so, commented. All right, well, it, tell it to us. <laughs> tell it. Tell the it. swing, well, it, it's told from the viewpoint of a preacher's wife. And uh, who is my grandmother, who uh, didn't feel that she could fit in with what they expected of a preacher's wife. It was a very unhappy marriage. And so you got conflict, 
uh, which you need for a short story. But it, the funny thing about this story is, uh, in writing about it, the church is described, the little girl describes feeling the peeling paint, peeling white paint of the outside of the church as she leans up next to it waiting for her grandmother and she feels it through her thin summer dress. Well, years and years later, I went back to this church for a funeral actually and the church is brick. It's not white. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so your so memory <laughs> had added to the, your uh, yeah. mistaken memory had added yeah. a great dimension to the yeah. story. And so I thought, oh, well, they bricked it or it's a church built after I was there and I looked back and it had been bricked since before I was born. Well, how does the um, memory memorization of Psalms fit into, or memorization of Bible verses fit into this? Tell us about that. Well, I did uh, remember spending like two weeks with my grandmother one summer because my grandfather was preaching a revival and he promised me that he would give me, I think it was 50 cents for every psalm I memorized. And so uh, he told me which ones were his favorites. And so I memorized the psalms. And uh, when he came home, I stood up, you know, my grandmother had worked with me and I stood up to say my verses for him. And there's something called a selah. At the end of, at in the some translation, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. and, and so I don't remember if this was true or if I made it up in the story, but I didn't, in the story, the little girl does not say the selahs and he doesn't give her the money. In your story, which is in all I've story. got to go by, really the little girl carefully memorizes the psalm as a, as a challenge from her grandfather, the right. preacher, the minister. Yeah to get, again, a quarter or 50 cents yeah. or something uh, important. She gets it absolutely perfect, but she doesn't say this extra word. Yeah. And the granddaddy almost with brutal enthusiasm says, you, you messed up. Yeah. And, it, and it, to me, it was a, a story of um, a lot of life for a lot of people <laughs> that they do everything right except a trick. One a trick, little thing. A trick yeah, that keeps trick. you. Yeah. But now, what was your point of the story? Uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the assignment. Um, I may go, I still have that book. You have. <laughs> no, but I'm thinking about, I mean, I, there's a, in, in, is it just a, a story that reminds us of how difficult it is sometimes as a child to deal with adults? Or is it a story of a marriage with the. Um, I think it's a story of a marriage. And I was observing that, but not really being aware of observing that. Well, there's another story that I like <laughs> a lot. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, in Seven, seven Lives. Seven oh, lives. a biography and This is seven another lives. story of a marriage, isn't it? Right? Or it's a story of a wife uh, maybe moving towards abandoning a marriage. <laughs> or Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I can remember where I was when I wrote these stories. Uh, the Swing was written when I lived in Charlotte, like I said, and um, Biography and Seven Lives, I was living on a little mountain in the Uari, so, uh, but I remember I had to walk uh, a mile every day down to get my mail. So the dog and I would walk down and I would get my mail, and I remember coming back and, and thinking, what am I doing here? How did I get here? And now, why I, were you there? Was this something your <laughs> husband did to you, or was it? Well, uh, it was both. It was both. We had uh, designed and built our own home in the Uaris, and he was teaching at a community college, and uh, so we had. Uh, it was a little mountain called Stone Mountain, not Georgia, but North Carolina Stone Mountain, and uh, we had bought a lot and uh, cleared it. And I remember when we were looking at the lot, uh, there was a huge beech tree on the property. And Talmadge said, has anybody bought that tree? And there was a little creek, just a perfect little tumbling creek. And I said, oh, has anybody bought that creek? And, uh, so they hadn't. So we bought the lot for the beech tree and the creek. And so there's a lot of that in this story. And there's another one called- No, 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 oh, okay. no, 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 I want you to go there, but first I want you to tell me the story of seven, what's, what's happening in this story? Well, uh, it's seven stages of a woman's life. You know, it starts when I think she's 17 and then, gee, I've forgotten all the stages. But it was an example of trying, okay, present tense. 
I was working in present tense. Okay, 15, 17, 19, 21, 24, 35, 40. And so so it's broken into segments. Well, it is an extraordinary uh, brief story of a life, yeah. of, of, of a woman's life and the conflicts that develop at different ages, or yeah. the uh, challenges that develop at yeah. different ages. And particularly with respect to this challenging husband who's, <laughs> who's, um, who, who's sometimes trying to find work and sometimes not trying to find yeah. work. Yeah. Well, somebody said about this story that it was the shortest autobiography they ever read. Well, was it autobiography? Was it autobi <laughs> There's a lot of autobiography, well, but, but you always add things. You well, now exaggerate. I'll just push you on this, but at, at 40, um, the, protagonist? the uh, protagonist or the narrator of this story, which you've described as autobiographical. Partly. Uh, uh, is, is in the... Um, is in the pond with the forest <laughs> ranger who's got a thick red beard. Where, and, and that's totally fictional. No, no, no. Yes, it you. is. I don't know a forest ranger. I mean, <laughs> but we did have a pond. The pond is is clear, but there. But uh, but anyway, no. Well, the forest well, ranger is fictional. Well, I love I love the story. There's no way to um, convey the story by talking about it in in total. But it is fair to say this is a great. Uh, I mean, it's a great read, but is but is why is it a, why is it a story? What, what what is the point? What is the culminating point in a, in this great um, writing? Well, I think it's uh, evolution. She is evolving, and somebody pointed out. I didn't realize this, but even the language evolves in the story. And uh, it was published in <coughs> Atlantic, and uh, Michael Curtis, who's supposed to be a terror of an editor asked me to change one thing. I had to change a colon to a semicolon. That was the only thing I ever changed in the whole story. Um, but it was used in a September issue because the woman goes back to school. Mm. So I thought that was good, you know. But so there was a transformative experience, not in the yeah. pond, but in the uh, commitment to go and, and make a new life yeah, educationally. Yeah. I think Education. it's more that. I think it's evolving. <coughs> what I was going to tell you, another story set in the Uaris is called The Summer Kitchen. And it began as a poem. And it was about making grape jelly. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it's really funny, but even that was published, I don't know, years and years ago. And I was in Texas doing a workshop and this woman said she was in Germany with her husband and she read that story and remembered it. And I think the reason people remember it is because it's built around the smell of cooking jelly, this wild grapes that are made into jelly. Well, is this short story really a poem? And it, because it's it, very I mean, close. Short and story and poem are hand in glove, I think. So that the the story is powerful. I mean, again, the short story's got a, it can't be a novel. You can't no. resolve all the problems, mm -hmm. but is there? something that got resolved in this story, <laughs> the I mean, other than this poetry of taking us into this cabin and putting us in the shoes of this woman who's wrestling with some other problems <laughs> as well. Well, uh, what, when I sold it to Red Book, uh, it was about the eighth story I had sent to them over a period of six or eight years. And when they accepted it, they said, we can't believe it took us this long to accept one of your stories. And I wasn't keeping count, I was just writing stories. But my husband said, when I told him I'd sold it to them, he said, oh, you sold another one of your plotless wonders. Oh, did he really? <laughs> he well, used to call them plotless wonders. <laughs> well, now you teach, you taught, uh, you teach other people about writing short stories. And do you uh, tell them, don't worry about the plot? Yeah, yeah. You, if you what, have a character, you have a plot. You, so you say, uh, a short story is a character study? Is that what a short no, story is? No, in a character study, it's more of a, a portrait and nothing really happens. Um, in a short story, there's some change. There's some uh, epiphany. The, the reader is going to look at something differently. Uh, the character in the story is going to change in some way. It can be emotionally. It can be physically. Uh, but there will be some change that makes it a short story rather than right. a character sketch. A character at a time of some transformation or right. change. Right, right. And, and that 
if I want to call that a plot, you'll accept it, but you can, you'll take your husband's plotless wonder <laughs> as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I took it as a compliment. <laughs> Because he meant it as a compliment, and he was always surprised, I think. And he never read my work until it was published, and sometimes not then. He was busy with his art. He didn't really pay that much attention. <laughs> <laughs> but what's so funny about that story is, in the story, um, Red Book wanted me to make the husband more visible. It's about a woman in a summer cabin with her children. And uh, so I was trying to think of ways to do it. And so I described a wood stove that he had restored, lovingly restored and everything. So after the story was published, this woman wrote me and she said, I have a wood stove just like that. Can I come see yours? And I thought, I have a microwave oven. I don't cook on a wood stove. <laughs> so I was glad it was that real. Well, it well, there's, I don't think it was this story, but there's another story, help me with this if you can remember it, about a husband who's, um, whose wife didn't think all that much of him, and, and, and then he went out and killed a, a copperhead. Oh, the snake. Wind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, it's called, um, ooh, what is the name of that? The Vinegar Jug, which yeah. uh, I, you know, you use as a writer, you use everything you've ever read, uh, Aesop's fables, uh, I think there's a fable about, oh, there's a fairy tale. There, and, and so fairy tales you've read, so there's a fairy tale called The Vinegar Jug. And uh, titles are so important. Well, what, 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 did, what did the killing, how did the killing of the snake, you had a, I mean, as, this is not, an, an, this is not um, an isolated theme in your work of a wife who sees her, who loves her husband, sort of, but he's just, <laughs> Not getting anywhere, well, and this guy finally kills a snake. And so, well, um, as a writer and an artist, you know, it's always a struggle. And so, for uh, many years when we lived in the Uaris, uh we were freelancing. He was doing art. I was writing for the Charlotte News. Uh, I was doing poetry in the schools. Uh, he was doing workshops. We did a lot of things. But uh, there's an old, you know, used folklore too. Uh, Writing is sort of like a patchwork quilt, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, and you don't really know. But there's a, a superstition that if you kill a snake and you hang it in a tree, it'll rain. So, you know, you you write these things and you sort of pull on your hard drive to put them together, I guess. Well, this story <laughs> resonated in some respects because um, it was opposite. My wife has uh, been all of over me about the danger in our yard for <laughs> copperheads, and I'm kind of poo-pooing uh -oh. her. This husband's been talking about the danger of snakes, and she's yeah. been poo-pooing until the snake comes and he kills him, and so and it was just sort of the opposite. Well, we didn't come to talk about my experience. We came <laughs> to talk about your stories in the, um, of this new collection, our Rules and Secrets, which as you pointed out to me is, is a compilation of a lot of your work, which has previously been published right. in other books. So if you want to go out and read Ruth Moose stories, just ask for the author and you'll find <laughs> work uh, either in the Rules and Secrets. But this Rules and Secrets story, which is the title story, it's about a, this, this, this made me cry almost, the story about oh. a teacher, a wonderful, do you remember this story? A yeah, wonderful yeah. teacher who comes in sets the classroom on fire, yeah. breaks a rule about coming, I understood it, if I'd been on the school board, I'd have probably made the same <laughs> rule, but you know, no over, no celebrations of Christmas this year, yeah. no presents, no yeah. parties, and so she just loves her kids, and so she, here, I'm telling the story, yeah. you should be telling the story, what am I missing? And, no, and I love to hear the, the feedback on a story, to hear what you remember. But uh, she, it's up in the mountains, and she, this is her first year, and she's one of these stars, or at least as I good looking, the kids love her, yeah. everybody loves her, and then what happens? Well, she does break the rule, and I, they had a Christmas party, and she gives them movie tickets, which, oh, movie, you know, a free pass to a movie. I think there was... She gives her kid, her, her students kids. a she gift. Gives her students prohibited a, to yeah, give prohibited. gifts, prohibited to give parties. And uh, so she, you know, is fired. But that story, um, a fr I have a friend who lives in Wilson, North Carolina, 
who um, we've been friends since second grade in elementary school. We still keep in touch. So when she read that story, she was crying too, and she called me and she said, "You've given me back my childhood." What did she mean? What did she mean? She you just took to, took it back to she where? Yeah, back to the situation, and she remembered the little girl in the story who was abused. And she said, you know, I think that's oh, why yes. I became oh, yeah. Yeah, a yeah. social worker. No, it's so funny because um, I'd, I'd left the little abused child out yeah. of this, but this teacher tried to deal with and rescue yeah. the way, and this, I mean, this is a story that everybody who complains about teachers ought to read about the kinds of things that teachers do for us for yeah. so little. I mean, yeah. it, it's, a, it, yeah, it's a celebratory reminder of what we get from teachers. I mean, now this is, see now you, you're getting this reaction from one of your readers, <laughs> but the uh, people who are watching want you to tell us about the stories. Well, um, you know, it, part of it is memory of that child. I don't remember what, if that actually happened or you take, a, it's like a grain of sand or something and you so start building and polishing and working. So well, I talk some more about it. So you take a real, one a of your most bit. successful is to take a real memory and then to build it, around it. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, and so it becomes fictionalized and um, and then later you think, how much of that really <laughs> happened? But um, but the, uh, the, the friends said, you know, she remembered the set, I think it's setting more than anything, and the teacher, but not all the other stuff that happened. Well, wow. well now you've been uh, writing now most of your life, and, and uh, writing is, you would like to point out that a, a lot of poetry as yeah. well. You're, you yeah. love poetry and love writing poetry. So, um, you. You've also been teaching other, or you've been coaching other people about. <laughs> it is coaching. How, is that is it more <laughs> yeah. coaching than teaching? Yeah, it's a, a lot of it. I always felt like when we were doing workshop that it was a team approach, and and I had a golden rule of workshopping: don't say anything or write anything on somebody else's paper that you wouldn't want written on yours. In other words, I just didn't tolerate cruelty. Cruelty doesn't help in a classroom, and it doesn't help when you're revising a story. So I just, you know, I said, uh, th be, be honest, but be careful. Well, uh, is, then is teaching or coaching other writers primarily uh, reading their work and making comments? Is that the, is Part that the of deal? It. And um, well, at at w teaching at UNC, which I always felt when I was interviewed for the job. Uh, I didn't have any idea I would get it because I, I told them, I said, you know I've never written a novel. And they said, we know that. We don't want a novelist. We want a short story writer. And for the first time I felt I had come home. I really did. I felt like I was at the place I was supposed to be. As a kind teacher, is that what you're... <laughs> I, I mean, hope. Well, but I, I mean, but I mean, be serious for a moment because in some cases a little bit of the rod is necessary to turn, isn't it, sometimes to um, turn a good, uh, someone with good potential but who's really on the wrong track? Do you just have to whisper yeah, in their ear and be kind that. to them? No, not particularly whisper, but you can show them on, pay, on the paper. Look, this story doesn't start, I had one, t one time a student, the story didn't start till page nine. <laughs> <laughs> you know? oh. And I said, how are you going to get the reader to read eight pages to get to the real story? And you've always got to keep the reader in mind. What do you tell them the first day? What do, or <laughs> what do you tell first day. them? Well, no, I mean, what are the most, if, you have, if you've only got 30 minutes with a writer and you want to share the wisdom of a lifetime, where do you start? What, 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 are, some, what are the uh, elevator speech for the, uh, here's how to be a good writer? <laughs> okay, the, the biggest thing is reading. And uh, I mean, everybody says that, but, but you just have to be a reader first and you love language and you love literature and, and I love short stories and poetry but you have to love all that so much you want to make something like it you want to make something of your own but and you want to try to be as good as that story you read and you never you know your Dora Welty is my favorite writer and Flannery O'Connor and so Catherine Ann Porter um, and so you never quite feel like this story isn't as good as your Dora Welty's, but it's mine. I made it. I like it. Well, that it. leads me to another <laughs> thing. It's uh, short, the market for short stories is not as good as we'd like for it to be. 
And for the um, kids that you taught and the workshops that you continue to lead, um, what, in, when you give an honest appraisal, what do you tell people about the prospect of making a living uh, writing short stories these days? Um, well, a, a lot of my students go into teaching. I've had several wonderful students go into the ministry. And I thought, my best writers. And I was telling a, a friend about this, uh, about this, and they said, well, ministers have to write they sermons. They tell stories every Sunday, don't they? they? Told, yeah. And they said, don't we deserve good sermons? And I said, yes. Yeah. So some of my best writers have gone into the ministry or they've become doctors. Wow. Or, so, uh, but a lot of them do become teachers. And I, I keep in touch with a lot of them. I uh, get wedding announcements, birth announcements. <laughs> well, all... Um, uh, uh, fodder for new short stories that I hope you'll be writing uh, oh. for a long time because um, your short stories teach us a lot about ourselves and also uh -huh. about the people we live with. So Ruth Moose, thank you so much for writing and for sharing your writing with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks to all y'all for watching and joining me in a conversation with Ruth Moose, the author of Rules and Secrets. And I'll be right back here same time next week. I hope you'll join me when I get to visit with another one of North Carolina's great writers. See you then. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council.